Okay, we're ready to get started here. We've got sign sheet going around. Um, Please make sure you get signed. Lauren, is the camera recording? Um, I don't know. It's on. It's on. <laughs> yeah. Um, got a sign sheet going around. Please make sure you get signed in. Got agendas and a handout going around. Um, so, uh, uh, just some general announcements about our compliance meetings. Um, obviously, thank you for coming. Attendance is expected uh, monthly. I know it's short notice this month. We'll try to get you on the schedule out. Um, any conflicts, uh, please make me aware and your support administrator aware before the meeting because then with the attendance sheet that goes around, um, then we do report to the support administrators about any uh, unexpected um, no-shows at these meetings. So, uh, you know, communication is key and making sure you sign in when you are here. Um, got the agenda going around, so uh, first thing, want to just uh, touch up on some of our department mental policies at the beginning of the year, have some new people and also just some reminders about what we're doing and also things are changing with Jump Forward, it's still in that process. So, CARA hours, like last year, submitted through Jump Forward weekly, um, so try not to fall too far behind on that, um, don't cause us problems because we need to then uh, get them out to student athletes. Um, of course, with Jump Forward, you are not having student athletes approve the hours. It's from the compliance office that we have the student athletes approve the hours. All you're doing is submitting the hours to us, so we need that in a timely manner so that it's fresh in the student athletes' minds and they're not looking at something from weeks or months ago by the time it gets to them. Phone logs, uh, we expect you to submit through Jump Forward approximately the 1st and 15th of the month. Um, the closest date that you are in office, we completely understand. That's not something that ever is going to come up in the performance review that it was the 17th before you turned in um, phone logs. Um, the way that process works, if you make phone calls through the Jump Forward app, it automatically logs the calls. All you're doing is clicking submit on Jump Forward, and what that's doing is assuring us that those are in fact all of your calls. We can see them before you click submit, but clicking submit assures us that that was all your calls. If you made calls not through the Jump Forward app, you're expected to manually enter those, which then submitting makes us aware that you have in fact manually submitted all calls made not through the app um, up to that point. So uh, twice a month, um, get phone logs submitted to Jump Forward. The recruiting approval request um, is still the paper form that we've always been using. Um, that was something we hope to have on Jump Forward this summer. It didn't happen, but we still hope to soon have it on Jump Forward. So obviously, if that changes at some point um, in the coming weeks, we'll let you know as soon as that happens so that we can cut that paper out of the process and do that on Jump Forward. But for now, recruiting approval before you go out recruiting off campus, print the form off the O-Drive and submit to us on your paper. When logging your contacts and evaluations from off-campus, that is done on Jump Forward. Um, so uh, that um, can be done uh, right after a visit. Um, you can do it from your phone. That's something that doesn't have to wait until you're back in the office. Um, you know, I don't know what. Different coaches have different preference. Um, some coaches like to do it while they still physically are at the location so they don't forget. Others keep handwritten notes and then do it back in the office. I don't care as long as you're doing it accurately and in a timely manner. Um, the declaration of coaching staff, um, another form we didn't get to upload on Jump Forward this summer. Um, at this point, um, a number of you have not submitted your declaration of coaching staff. If you could print those off the O drive, get them submitted to me, um, and that we will have on Jump Forward at some point, but there's really no rush on that since it's for most of it, I know there's coaching changes throughout the year, but mostly it's a beginning of the year and done. So <coughs> obviously the target is before next year to have that form on Jump Forward. Uh, but those are some of our um, basic <coughs> policies. Uh, so hopefully everyone can stay on top of those paperwork kinds of boring side of compliance. Does anyone have any questions about any of those processes? Okay then, um, I'll get into this presentation now. Um, so, giving a presentation, um, usually this first meeting of the year, we go over new legislation to make sure everyone's up to speed on what just went into effect <coughs> here, but there really 
wasn't anything significant um, this year. I think the biggest one was the strength and coaches, strength and conditioning coaches certification, um, which um, we've talked about. But other than that, there was not much to go over a new legislation review. So um, at this time of year, um, you know, kind of the beginning, and not a lot of things have come up yet. But the playing and practice season as something that needs to be declared at the beginning of the year and affects all of your practices is always relevant. So good time for this presentation. Um, once again, like many of the presentations past, this was one made by the NCAA, so not all of it is necessarily topical. Um, so I'll just skip those slides, but this is coming right from the NCAA. Um, one of the people you see named there, Mo Hardy, is uh, from the NCAA, actually signed as Northeast Conference Contact. So it's not that any of you know who Mo is, but she's someone we know in the compliance office. Um, so to start with uh, some of the interpretations of countable athletically related activity. Um, some of these are fairly recent interpretations, so um, you may not be aware of them. Uh, they are the golf specific ones, so I won't spend too much time on it. The golf coaches can talk to me about it if they have questions. Um, but um, if you're practicing for golf and it doesn't meet the legislation definition of a practice round that's part of competition, then you count the actual hours, you don't treat it as part of the competition. It's pretty straightforward. Um, this interpretation uh, is actually on the back of the handout I gave you because it relates to voluntary activities. It's from February of this year. Um, rather than go over the slideshow version of it, I'll hold off till we get to the handout after the presentation and we'll go through the actual wording of the interpretation. Um, this is a continuation of that one. Um, here's one about coaching staffs being involved with student athletes from other teams, other than that coaching team. So, uh, that institutional coaching staff member may be a coach of an outside team, including student athletes from the institution's other teams, provided that nothing is done at the direction of the <coughs> institutional coach. So, um, if you're coaching an outside team and someone from another sports on it, that coach can't say, oh, that's great, you get to work with them, so make them do these workouts, these are the workouts I want them doing, um, doesn't, you can't do anything at their direction uh, in this scenario. Um, I'll skip all of these women's volleyball specific. Um, basketball practice scrimmage. I'm going to skip um, all the slides because again it's a sports specific one but um, I'll just say the basics um, because some of you, um, I think the basketball coaches are very aware of the rules about a practice scrimmage but some of you are kind of confused about the things that go on around the basketball practice scrimmage because you don't know the rules so um, again just very basic because uh, it doesn't pertain to you directly but um, the big thing with basketball practice scrimmages is that they have to be closed. Um, so that's why we take such lengths to make sure that um, you know we have a very open arena. It's in a building that's open at most times, but when we host a practice scrimmage, we have to, by NCAA rule, um, make sure that it is not open and people aren't just walking through and stopping to watch it because um, Practice scrimmages are allowed to occur before a competition otherwise would be allowed. Um, so uh, in having that competition at a time when we otherwise can't, we have to make sure we're following all the rules um, to make sure that it's conducted in privacy. All right, uh, into the bulk of it, the countable related activities. Um, so. Uh, this isn't really a presentation to go over the basics of countable athletic related activities. I mean, all of you as coaches should be aware of what hour limits you have and weekly limits and what things do count and don't count. So hopefully that's not what anyone's struggling with at this point, but uh, these are some of the scenarios that come up. Um, so promotional activities. Uh, promotional activities can occur at any time of the year, but if they're involving athletically related activities in the promotional activity, um, then of course you must count those hours. You can't exempt them as promotional activity hours if something countable is occurring. Um, because you have to count the hours, if it's outside the playing season, um, then uh, and, it, and it's a promotional activity involving countable 
activities, then it must be voluntary um, because outside of when you're in the eight hour segment, um, it's very specific. Um, most, uh, at most, two of those hours can be skill instruction, the rest is all strength and conditioning. There's no provision for promotional activity, um, countable activities. So, outside the playing season, um, a coach cannot be present at a promotional activity that is <coughs> countable activities. Um, so here is a case study on here. Uh, even though we don't have wrestling, it kind of the questions to be asked in the case study it would be relevant to any sport. I mean, the specific answers will end up being specific to wrestling, but um, it's really about the thought process. So um, the institution wants to set up wrestling mats at the fan fest area of a home football game. Um, and then they want to have the wrestling student athletes out there doing an exhibition. Um, so performing, drawing a crowd in to watch the guys wrestle in friendly competition. Um, so the questions, you know, is the team in or out of season? What portion of the playing season? Um, could this be considered part of skill instruction? Um, these are kind of the questions you need to run through. Um, and. Uh, Again, now we're getting wrestling specific, but since wrestling cannot start before October 1st, um, I think the previous slide said it was the first football game, so most likely it was occurring um, way the first home football game would be before October, so they'd be outside the playing season, um, and skill instruction cannot be publicized or conducted in view of the general public audience, so therefore this scenario would not work out. Um, what if it's voluntary? Well, voluntary activities cannot be arranged or organized. Um, and this clearly, by the facts presented, was being organized by the athletics department um, to put on the event. It wasn't the wrestling team asking to set up this activity. All right, another case study. So the marketing office wants to put on a youth softball clinic after a contest, and they want to have the softball student athletes lead some of the simple drills <coughs> with the kids in attendance. So um, you, you means the compliance office in this, uh, the way this is written, but we're concerned that it would count as CARA, and of course everyone should know that there's no CARA permitted after competition until the following calendar day. So. Um, should you be concerned about this, um, or is it permissible? Uh, since participation in camps and clinics is not considered CARA, it would be permissible, um, provided that it's made voluntary, uh, and so the team is not being mandatory that they stay to do this. If they are um, fatigued from the competition, or uh, you know, feel that they completed the competition and they have a lot of studying to do or paper to write, they have to be allowed um, to leave because it must be voluntary in this situation. All right, um, national championships, um, international championship qualification, national team tryouts, these types of activities. Um, when a student athlete is preparing, may the student athlete participate with the student's coach, Yes, um, but it must be considered CARA, which means that you must be in a time period when you can conduct CARA, um, unless the coach, the institutional coach, is a coach designated by the national governing body of the event, um, in which case there's exceptions for that. Um, this is, and again, goes on with when an institutional coach is a participant in some uh, national championship, international um, type events. Um, so there's exceptions for a coach being a participant as well as student athletes. Um, <coughs> national team tryout competition. So this is always the uh, fine line, or at least in the coach's mind, it's a fine line. The NCAA thinks it's more clear in most cases, but what is uh, a tryout um, and what is not. Um, so national team tryouts, um, a coach can, an institutional coach can coach their student athlete at the national team tryout. Um, the idea being you do not need to be designated by the national governing body because if it's a tryout, the national governing body likely is not coaching up the student yet. Um, or the athlete at that time, um, of course, they would make the team 
for the national governing body coaches to step in and coach them. So you, as their institutional coach, can be their coach to help them get to that point of making the team. I'm helping out with triads. Um, uh, and even if it's outside the playing season, if there, if um, a national team tryout is actively occurring at the moment, uh, you can work with your student athletes. Um, of course, if you're ever in this situation, as much notice as possible, speaking with us in the compliance office, making us aware that this is a possibility, these are the dates, this is the but to be aware of. Um, you know, I know sometimes they might come up quicker than others where someone gets a phone call from someone or gets invited to something, but a lot of times you can predict out when someone might be in such a situation and work with us, we'll help you know what you can do and can't do. Um, in, in the individual sports, um, you know that uh, over the summer and vacation periods, you can on an occasional basis uh, work out with your student athletes at their request. Okay, so another case study, we've got a cross country student athlete chosen to attend a tryout for the Mexican national team in February. In preparation, she would like the institution's coach to work out with her to prepare. Is it permissible? Um, if it's counted as CARA, then it's permissible, which leads to the follow-up. But I thought it was permissible, no matter what, to work with tryouts. But the way this was specifically worded, um, the co if the coach is a designated Mexican national team coach, then yes, they could work with a student athlete. But this is not the tryout itself. The question was about working with the student athlete to prepare them for the tryout, which has to be CARA. It's only during the tryout that the exception applies that you can be their coach. All right, so payment of fees associated with voluntary activities. Um, it is permissible for the institution to pay fees to reserve an off-campus facility for voluntary, um, even if it's outside the player playing the practice season, if it's during the academic year. If it's during the summer, it can only the institution can only pay the fees if it is the regularly used facility. So this is tennis example that applies for St. Francis, where um, in Evansburg that is our regularly used facility, so we can pay for it to be available for court time for voluntary workouts in the summer, um, but we couldn't pay for our student athletes court time at any other off-campus facility. Um, in the summer. Skip all the baseball slides. Um, I'm going to skip the far tour because we don't do these often and if you are planning a far tour, I would certainly hope you're communicating with the compliance office early and often about what goes into it. Um, here are some questions that the NCA gets frequently. Um, one is about uh, when the wording of the official catalog listing of vacation period. So if the official catalog lists, for example, a Thursday and Friday as vacation, but doesn't list the Saturday and Sunday that immediately follow them, well, everyone, the way we think, thinks that's a four-day vacation. But it's worded at the catalog as a two-day vacation and then a weekend. Um, so can the institution <laughs> accept those days as if they're vacation days? Um, yes, if no care is occurring on those days, those weekend days, Saturday and Sunday, those also can be exempted from counting against your 132 or 144, whatever your score is at for numbers. Publicity of skill instruction and voluntary workouts. Um, voluntary workouts, which coaches are permitted to be present at. So, uh, there's always questions about what, what does the NCAA mean when they say it can't be publicized? Does that mean before or after? The short answer is before the event they can't be publicized. It can be publicized after the event, what happened at the event. Um, the idea is not to make the public aware because they must be closed to the public anyway, so why even go down that road of maybe people will want to show up if they find out about it and then it's a difficult compliance situation. Um, so information may only be shared after the workout has concluded, um, and that cannot include information regarding future workouts. So, you know, um, giving you know a quote about a workout one day, and then 
slipping up and saying about what you plan on doing the next day, or you know, then report that. That's got to be a self-report right there because you're talking about a future skill instruction. Um, uh, competition after the conference tournament. Most sports do permit uh, competition after um, competition after the conference tournament if you are still in season, even if you haven't qualified for whatever the next tier is, in most cases, NCAA competition. So in most sports, um, for that matter, most sports allow practice after the conference tournament. The idea is, uh, the, the key thing is that you would have to have days left. Um, so uh, if you plan your days based on starting so that your days are used up on the conference tournament, as a lot of you do, then this is a moot point. You wouldn't have any days left, but some of you do have days left, um, and then do want to extend your season, even if you haven't qualified. Do still want to do some workouts in the 20-hour segment after um, the conference tournament, which is again most sports it's permissible for, um, and it is even permissible to schedule competition after the conference tournament. Um, provided you have a day of competition left, of course, uh, you probably would be. No reason to intentionally schedule something, but we're talking sometimes about um, canceled competitions where maybe both teams didn't advance beyond the conference tournament. Both teams still have days left, and the teams want to get that competition in just to be one more competition. So that is permissible, again, for most sports, not a common scenario. So um, a lot of these things are. I'm saying them now, but really what it comes down to is talk to the compliance office if you're in this situation. Club teams. Um, a club team can be part of the national governing body tryout. Um, a lot of times in swimming, this is the case. Other sports, it may or may not be the case. So just know your sport. Um, and if you have questions, ask. Um, so that is the presentation. Now we'll take a look at the handout. Um, so, um, which goes along with the presentation. On the one side, we've got the legislature <laughs> of what a voluntary activity is. Um, this is very important. Um, it comes up a lot. Uh, when I say a lot, I mean relatively speaking. In terms of the issues that student athletes bring to my attention, it's a fairly frequent among those issues is Coach is saying it's voluntary. I don't think it's voluntary. Um, a lot of times, it's just in the way you say it or present it, but there are actually NCAA rules about it to fall back on. So you might completely, honestly swear and know in your heart that you did not think that it was mandatory and you really wouldn't have cared if someone didn't show up. But if you don't follow these specific rules, it doesn't meet the NCAA definition of voluntary. Um, so going through these, um, obviously the student athlete cannot be required um, to go, but they can be required to report back after the activity. Um, and any staff member who's there, um, of course, coaches should not be at voluntary activities in almost every case. But uh, strength and conditioning can be there. The trainers can be there. Um, in some situations, a manager can be there. You know, maybe. Um, someone to rebound balls for the student athlete. A manager could be there, but a coach couldn't. Any of those people who are there cannot be reporting back to coach about the activity. Um, that takes away the appearance of being voluntary. It's like someone's checking up on them. It's like if coach doesn't get a good report, maybe they'll punish the student athlete in some way. And all psychologically, it takes away the idea of the student athlete. Voluntary really is supposed to mean our limits are imposed on you as the coach to make sure that you balance the student athlete's time. But a student athlete on their own can decide to do extra work. That's what voluntary is all about, them deciding on their own, not you making them. Um, so moving on to B, the activity must be initiated and requested by the student athlete. Um, obviously, no one can require a student athlete to participate. Um, then we get to the however. It is permissible for a staff member to provide information about the availability of facilities. So sometimes um, 
the student athlete needs to initiate it, but at the same time, the student athlete might not know. I mean, we share a lot of facilities here, as a lot of schools <coughs> do, but um, they might not know when another sport is on the facility or when a facility might be locked or someone would be uh, operating, especially something like maybe they want to do um, extra lifts in the weight room. Um, obviously, our strength and conditioning staff would need to be aware of what their lifting schedule is. Um, but so you as a coach can make them aware of the availability of facilities, but that's very strict on not telling them um, this is a voluntary activity I'd like you to go to. Just very simply, for those of you who have been interested, these are the times it's available. Other than that, it must be initiated by the student athlete. Um, Attendance cannot be recorded. Again, that's similar to the first part where it goes back to maybe you wouldn't do anything about it. Maybe you have no intention of following up. You just want the information, but you could theoretically take action um, based on who was there, who wasn't there, which leads into the last part that um, there can be no penalties for not participating. Um, and then the flip side of that is there can be no recognition or incentives for attending. Um, that then it's like, well, are they doing it because that's what they want to be doing, or because um, they feel like because of the praise someone else got or something tangible that that's the reason they're doing it. Um, this is if you look at the bottom box. I know when I put these things out, you don't usually look there. Major infraction cases. Um, they. There have been 11, um, which is a relatively high number, especially when you look at the top in parentheses when we've got when these bylaws were established. We've got a bylaw first adopted in 2001 to have 11 major infractions. That's not talking about the secondary violations that occur all the time in all sorts of activities. 11 major infractions just related to violating the definition of voluntary. So, it is a big deal. Um, it's, I know a lot of you feel like it puts you in a difficult situation where a student athlete can just say they didn't feel it was voluntary, but ultimately that is the reality. Um, they have to truly feel that it was voluntary for it to be voluntary. So um, be very aware of the language you're using and how you are presenting things. Um, to make sure something that you intend to be voluntary and to not count on in your CARA is meeting the NCAA definition of what is voluntary. If you flip that over, you'll see the interpretation that I skipped in the slideshow because the slideshow is just kind of a recap for it, and I have the full interpretation right here. Um, we've got an institution's coaching staff member may not observe enrolled students or student athletes, so it's any enrolled student, it doesn't just refer to your team, in non-organized, athletically related activities outside of the playing season. Um, a coaching staff may observe enrolled student athletes or student athletes, enrolled students or student athletes in organized, athletically related activities, um, including things like intramurals on there, provided the coach is not directing or supervising the activity. Um, so I know a lot of you don't allow your student athletes to participate in intramurals anyway, but uh, for those of you, maybe you do in the off season and maybe they're in a big intramurals game and you're in the office anyway and you want to go see how they're doing out there and it's in a different sport and this is saying you're allowed to do that. It's not really um, violating the rules or the intent of uh, countable activities to um, watch some student athletes and in intramurals in a different sport. Um, but of course you can't be setting up those activities to force them to stay in shape or something like that. Um, if prospective student athletes are also participating in any organized athletic activity, coaching staff may only observe um, if it occurs at a permissible contact or evaluation period. And the staff noted, which is in the legislation anyway, that in individual sports, the coach may participate in some individual workout sessions at the request of the student athlete. So, um, that's uh, a lot of the uh, more in-depth playing and practice season things. I know um, a lot of the basics that you do, you just declare your season, you 
mostly know how to do that. You know the recording of hours, but just gives you more of the in-depth behind a lot of the hours. Between that presentation and the handout, if you have any questions on any athletic related activities in the planning practices. Okay, great. I'm just going to run through real quick. Well, I'm not going to. I'm going to let Erica, Lauren, or Robin chime in with any updates they may have. Nothing from Erica. Just really quick, um, if, you, if you guys haven't had the need to use a change roster form, I sent out an email midsummer. It's on Jump Forward in your form library. Um, it's kind of weird when you click on the, the form itself, you have to click submit form to actually fill it out before you do anything. Um, and once you do that, it comes to me. So if you make any additions or deletions to your roster, that's the way to do that. Have fixed the problem that football's been bugging me about for the last year. Um, that anyone who quits, leaves the university, will not show up on CARA, um, your CARA hours anymore. So I tried to go through anybody that was deleted to this point and get rid of them. But if you're seeing somebody that shouldn't be there when you're filling out CARA hours right now, please just shoot me an email and I'll get rid of them for you. Um, if you have anybody that needs to be added to IRL or taken off, let me know. Any questions about official visits or anything to look at to approve, let me know. And also, whoever hasn't signed the um, certification of compliance, if I can grab you before you leave today, that'd be awesome. Okay, open for any general compliance questions. Great, thanks for your time.